and they click do and then and then that's it. Um, and there you go. Progress report. Hi, uh, welcome back to the Hope and Healing Center for one of our CARES Lunch and Learn programs. I'm Peggy Datermeyer. I'm the McGee Fellow and the Director of CARES and about to observe my seventh anniversary here. So it's been a long time. Um, first manning the computer is Rabbi Seth Stander, who is uh, our community aging specialist. And we are very excited today to have Maureen Brunetti um, to talk to us about how to hire a caregiver. You won't be able to um, see it if you sit there. Why don't you try that corner and then you'll be able to see yeah, the screen. Yeah, you'll be able to see the screen. Oh, thank you. That's all. Maureen but and I go. I, I'm comfortable with you next to me. We go later. Yeah. Well, I can hear better. We go back uh, more years than I care to think about. Um, she was the palliative care nurse at Memorial Herman Memorial City Hospital when I was one of the staff chaplains. Mm -hmm. And so we used to work together a lot mm -hmm. on helping various families with various issues. But Maureen is a nurse by training. She got her degree at Gwynedd Mercy College, now Gwynedd Mercy University in Pennsylvania. And uh, she's lived a bunch of different places, but landed in Houston. Um, she has done a bunch of different things. She has been um, working at CCSC, training uh, prospective caregivers. Mm -hmm. And um, now she's uh, embarking on a new part-time career as a uh, um CPR and other kind of trainer, still with a lot of caregivers, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. nursing staff at Methodist Hospital. Um, she has lots of interesting experiences. Mm -hmm. And so um, I invite you to tune in and I hope you enjoy today's presentation. And remind me at the end, I'll give you our commercial for next year's programs. This Today is the last Lunch and Learn of this season, although we're doing a book study the last two Mondays in July and the first two Mondays in August on Kate Bowler's two books, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved, and... Um, no cure for being human and other things I need to hear. Mm -hmm. um, she's a, a remarkable human being and that session is more informal. It's a book study as opposed to a lecture presentation. But take it away, Maureen. Well, I am so happy that everybody is here. I'm glad to see people in person and thrilled that some people are joining us on Zoom. So take it away, Seth. I guess you're gonna drive. You just tell me when to advance. Drive. Okay. Okay. So what I did was put together some steps for hiring a caregiver. Seth is going to share this with everyone. I also have some documents at home that I will have to scan into my computer so I can email them to Seth to send out to you some sample contracts. So I didn't write them. I didn't make them up. They're from care.com and HomePay and some other companies. So people who know what they're doing and if, oh, Seven steps to hire a great in-home caregiver. Now, this is not family caregivers. We're, we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but this is if you have to hire somebody to come in and take care of you, yourself, a loved one, a family member, you're, you're helping. I've actually had people who were powers of attorney and helping neighbors. They weren't even, they weren't even related to them. So Seth is going to send this. I'm glad you're taking notes, but he's also going to send this to everybody. So you want to find somebody who gets along with them. You know, not everybody, not every square pegs, round holes, not everybody is going to fit. And they might be a great person and a lovely, wonderful person, but they're not the right fit for your situation. So, and when you find that out, we're just going to be nice about it when we, you know, when we tell them that that's not working out. So being a caregiver is easier said than done. This is a very difficult job, which you already know if you've been taking care of anybody in your life, you know, this is not easy. And there are people that God bless them that want to be nurses and caregivers and nurses aides and, and patient care assistants. So God bless them all and physical therapists and everybody else who's in healthcare. So this is a trying, difficult job. And the pandemic saw a mass exodus. Hospitals were empty. There were, they couldn't admit patients because there was no staff. Nurses who could retire did. 
PCAs, patient care assistants who could retire did, caregivers who could give up their job said, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go work at Amazon. I'm, I'm not going to go into people's homes and take care of sick people. I don't want to have that exposure. So here's about seven steps plus a couple little extra things to help walk you through this whole process. And the idea is to find the right person, hire them, and then keep them. Because just because you hired them, if it doesn't work out, people are not obligated to stay. So you want to make sure that, again, good fit and that you're hiring the right person for the situation. Okay, so when might you need a caregiver? What, what's going on in, in your life or your, or your person's life that might require you to have some extra help? Well, when a progressive disease process makes it no longer possible for a person to care for themselves safely, say their ALS, you know, their Lou Gehrig's disease is progressive, and now they just, it's not safe for them to be alone in the house anymore or alone uh, and, and care for themselves and worry about making food in the kitchen and, and leaving the stove on, burning the house down. All the various kinds of dementia, Alzheimer's is just one of them. It is the most well-known and it is the most prevalent, but it is not by far the only one. There's five or six different dementias, and but the end result is the same they're not going to be safe to stay home alone. Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, any of the other progressive degenerative, any other progressive degenerative disease that would then make it difficult for somebody to care for themselves. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes when you're living with someone, you don't even notice how much they've declined. And somebody will come in, a family member or a friend that hasn't seen you for six months, and they'll be like, holy cow. I didn't know grandma had gotten so bad. And you're like, what are you talking about? She's fine. No, not fine. So sometimes it takes other eyes to see the situation and say, hmm, you might be being a little bit unrealistic about your ability to continue to care for this person safely. And that's the, that's the key is being safe. So after an acute event or an injury, say a major stroke, a heart attack, or an accident, Dad fell off the ladder and broke a bunch of things. He was in a car accident, broke a bunch of things. A major planned medical procedure, for example, spine surgery, you're going to have multiple decompression or you're going to have a big rod put in your spine and it's planned, but you know you're going to be laid up for six full weeks after. And even after you get out of the hospital and rehab and skilled nursing and all the rest of that, you still may need some assistance at home. So when you have a planned surgery, so if you know my surgery is going to be on July 1st, I'm going to be in the hospital and I'm expected to get out of care, inpatient care, August 15th. So you can give somebody some lead time because people, if they already have clients, they need to work around that and say, oh, well, I'm not available on these days, but I'm available on these other days. Can you work with me? So the more, the more notice you can give somebody is probably a good thing. And then uh, spine surgery, hip surgery, any other big major planned procedure. Now, during cancer care, uh, sometimes really what a person might need is just rides to chemo and, and radiation therapy. They might need, not need a lot of hands-on care at home. Uh, they might, um, I just, Car Carmen, um, Dr. Reddy Roy, mm -hmm. okay. His daughter came and helped me. Mostly what she did was she made me cups of tea and brought them to me because I was on a cane and I could not carry a cup and saucer or a mug safely from my kitchen because I don't have a table in the kitchen. The table's out in the dining area and I could not carry plates of food and drinks back and forth. So she came and stayed with me every day for about two weeks after surgery. So that was so that was planned and it worked out just great because it was um, it was a break time for her. So but sometimes they don't need a lot of hands on, they don't need bathing and they don't need help to get dressed, but they need some meal prep. They need, make me a cup of tea, or can you um, just help me get up? And, you know, if, if they're lying on the sofa, they might need assistance to sit up straight without getting dizzy and just walk to the bathroom, especially if they're using any kind of an, um, a gate device, a walker, a wheelchair, uh, a cane. So, or respite care so that 
the rest of the family can go to your grandchild's wedding or your graduation or some other big, somebody had a, a, a christening, somebody has a big family event, but you can't leave because you're caring for this other person. And if they need care, then you're going to have to hire caregivers to take care of just for the, say, the five days, five or seven days. And respite care, I want to jump. If your loved one is in hospice, respite care is provided and you can go into a facility. You can go into an assisted living facility for five days and that's covered by Medicare in the hospice, under the hospice provision. So, but that's a separate thing. We're not really going there, but, um, and exactly for those kinds of, sometimes people don't need to go anywhere. They just need a staycation, but they just need a break. So, but if you have a planned event out of town, you might need caregivers, or you might decide, uh, mom, I need to, you know, can you, would you be okay with staying in a facility for a few days so that we can go to, um, you know, Johnny's graduation up at A&M, you know, and, and take him on a little trip. So that's hard. And it's hard to leave the other person behind. But again, if it's not safe for them to travel, um, I've actually had requests for people, for caregivers to travel with people, but that's, that is, I was never able to place anybody to do that because the caregivers have their own families and their own lives and they don't want to leave town for five days because they can't get care for their own, you know, their own situation. Okay. Where do you think you might find somebody? So word of mouth. If you know that your neighbor has a caregiver, uh, ask them, hey, I see, the, I see that you have somebody comes every day. I see she comes out in a little uniform, or maybe she's got a, <clears throat> a magnetic sign on her car that says care.com or it says, you know, Mary's caregiving. You might see the, the, the magnetic sign and you're, you're alerted that, oh, there's a caregiver at my neighbor's house several days a week. How do you like her? You know, is, is she taking on new clients? So word of mouth would be the best way to get somebody. The next door app, one of the girls in my class, we were talking about the next door. Cause I said, where, where are you going to find jobs? They, I was asking them, where do they think they were going to find jobs? And I mentioned to them the next door app and at lunchtime during the class, during the break, one of the girls put her information on next door by the end of class she had two jobs that day <laughs> so I was like yeah see there's a need there's a need for caregivers and so think about it. the next door app are going to be people near you so your next door app is going to be different you know my next door app is different from Peggy's and different from Seth's because you know just because we don't live in the same same area Facebook senior groups there are five or six senior groups on Facebook I cannot manage more platforms than just Facebook. I can do email. I can do text. I can't, I'm not going to be on Twitter and Instagram and God knows whatever else is out there. I just, I just can't. I, I have a life. I can't, you know, I, I, it's not all spent, you know, on the screen, but there are multiple groups. So if you, if you were on, if you have a Facebook account, you can find them pretty easily. For me, it's my groups my groups. So I have a whole ton. Senior services providers, networking, serving senior citizens. So then there's, uh, there's wish they were in order. Houston Senior Care Network. Mm -hmm. And then there's, and I can say, I'll, I'll make this list and send it to you as well. And then there's just, there's, Houston healthcare, Houston area healthcare senior care. So, and then the senior air, Houston area senior care advisory group, and then healthcare and business networking. So there's, and then there's referral res, referral resources senior healthcare. So there's multiple groups, and a lot of the same people are on all of these. And I encouraged uh, my caregiver students to join them and post that they were available and they were looking for, you know, looking for clients in a certain zip code. So, excuse me, uh, other social media, if you, if God bless you, if you're on Instagram and Twitter and God and all the rest of them go for it. And you can just put out, uh, put out a, re a request in your area that you were looking for a caregiver in zip code. Uh, you can look on LinkedIn 
their caregivers, I suggest that they get on LinkedIn, but most of them, that was a little too, they thought that was a little too fancy and too sophisticated for them. That wasn't really a thing that they were, that they felt comfortable doing, but I was trying, some of the younger ones thought LinkedIn was, was going to be okay for them, but some of my older caregivers, they just had not, again, they, a little bit of tech phobia, and I, I get that. So local churches, not just the church you are a member of, but ask around in other smaller churches. There may be people that put up a notice in the church office that they are looking for clients. So you can check in with other churches and in, in your area and see who's who's looking who's looking for work. Look in your library, uh, local library. I used to put flyers out for my classes and I would get responses that people saw my flyer in in the library and signed up for class. So that's telling me that there are people there that are taking a computer class in the library, or at least learning how to, they're practicing their computer skills and they may be doing job searches on the computer in the library because they might not have one at home, but they have themselves an email address and they can, they can reach out. So you can put a flyer up in the library and there are, there are open public uh, posters, uh, built, um, bulletin boards, and you can post, you can post a flyer that you're looking for a caregiver. And all you have to say is caregiver needed zip code, blah, blah, blah. Please contact Mary Smith at this number. And you don't have to put a whole lot of information. Anybody who's interested can call you. You don't want to put your address, you don't really, or an email, you know, you can put either an email or a phone number. And if you're going to put, it might be a good idea to create a separate Gmail account just for that purpose and just say, you know, Mary needs a caregiver at gmail.com or whatever you want to say it is. And so that you know that only the people that are that are responding to that email are, um, you know, you still get spam. I promise you, you'll still get spam to that email address, but it won't be clogging up your regular email. And it also, you won't miss, you won't miss a posting from somebody who is trying to get together with you to get a job. Now, agencies, uh, agencies, these are people I know personally, the people that found Alex at Family Tree. He's mm -hmm. still around. I still hear from him. Reach, Home Care, they're in Bel Air. Uh, home Instead, there are multiple. Uh, there are some Home Instead people who are very active with CCSC, Home Instead business owners. That's an individually owned franchise. Same thing with Griswold. So uh, these are some people that have been active with Christian Community Service Center, and they have been supportive of my program, and they have come to uh, some of my job fairs. So I've met these people and know that they are respectable, responsible people who treat their caregivers well. Now, the caveat, we're going to talk about money in a minute. Agencies are going to be more expensive. They got to pay for the lights in the building and the, the tea. So expect to pay a lot more to an agency than you would to a private caregiver. So, okay. Now, I am going to send you a at least one, and the home the the one I'm going to send you is twelve pages. You're going to be like, I need a twelve page document. Yeah, you do, because it is very complete and it will help you think about all the things that you that you just automatically do. I mean, Peggy and I were talking about this, and I said, well, yeah, if you want your caregiver to take out the trash every Thursday then you have to put that in the contract. That's part of her duty to do. And then if it's not done, then you can fuss a little bit, but she might not think to do it if it's not written down. Do you need her to feed the dog? Do you need her to clean up after the cat? What do you need the caregiver to do? Are they going to be feeding and bathing and dressing and doing laundry for the, for the client? Or are they just gonna come in and be sitter companion and take them to get to the doctor's appointments, take them to get their hair done. There are various levels. Do you have a client who's got a complete and total, completely and totally paralyzed and uses a Hoyer lift? Have you ever seen one of those? It's a sling and it's on a, it's on a, a, a metal frame with wheels and you can push the person around the house. Uh, there's a home not far from here that they have a full house Hoyer lift. They have the they have the the track is in the ceiling. And so when they get him out of bed in the morning, he goes along the track and they just kind of and yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh yeah, he's a total spinal cord injury patient. And and wow. That's a pretty elaborate setup. But a lot of people just use the the basic Hoyer lift that 
they're easy to use, but you do need training for that. So that would be heavier duty care, which might also read cost more. Okay. So to do this, you got to think about the client's needs. What do you need for your caregiver to do? And and then once you start writing this stuff down, even before you you know get a copy of the contract, if you've got somebody in mind now, I mean, if you're all here, either you need this for somebody now or you're good for you, you're planning ahead for either for yourself or for uh, another person in your life. Start thinking about what do they need to do? Are there steps in the home? How many steps? How many floors? Um, Ron Smike, I've just put an elevator in this house. Dr. Fred Nino, who... Um, yeah, so because make make it easier for for him to get around. So what's available to help, and what kind of equipment do you have in your home that the caregiver is going to learn need to learn how to use safely? Okay, so it helps to mentally walk through a full week of care. I mean, literally hour by hour. Do so you get up at seven o'clock? Then you let the dog out. You feed the dog. You scoop the cat. You know. You, you make sure that the cat's got food and water. What you all that oh, you're going to do laundry? Oh, you got to change the bed because sometimes you know, grandma has an accident. Do you have to change? Does she wear? Depends. What is what's going on? And think about how elaborate is the bath? Is it something that once I get her in the bathroom, she can stand by the sink, or I can? She's in a. She, we have a shower that has um, a safe door and has a seat and has handheld shower um, sh um, shower head. Do you have all that? And if you don't have all that, we're going to talk about, you might need to be thinking about making some adjustments to your, to your house. Some of them are big deal expensive. Some of them are not so much. You can get tub benches and shower chairs very cheaply. Uh, you can go to St. Vincent de Paul or Goodwill and find one and scrub it down. And they, they're great. Or you can go and buy a new one. Our buddy, Russell, uh, and then handheld showers are easy. You get them at Target and they just unscrew, unscrew the, the old shower head, put in the new one. And that's then that's fair and that's fine. And most people can use us without a problem once you set the temperature. So simple things. But also if you decide, ooh, I've really got to do a serious bathroom revamp, that can get to be very pricey. But there are simple things like uh, toilet grab bars. It doesn't require any tools. And it doesn't damage your your bathroom at all. It's bars like it's 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 uh, side hand, handlebars, side rails. Side, it's not side rails. What are we going to call these handles? Handles. Right. Handles. It doesn't sound that doesn't sound fancy enough. Armrests. Armrests. Okay. Arm. Armrests. Okay. When arm you say handlebars, I think Harley. So, I know. And so I'm thinking that too. I'm thinking that's not right. Yeah. So what you do is you lift up the toilet seat. You set this down and it's got it's got feet on the floor. There's fancy ones that even have magazine racks, but you can get a simple basic one. Uh, get a simple basic one and then just plop the seat back down. And so that when the person comes, they've got something to hold on to for them to sit down and stand up with. And um, it's, they're easy to get, easy to order online. You can order them from Amazon. Medicare, or, Medicare will pay for it. And Medicare will pay for it. And also, uh, if somebody needs, if somebody has trouble get in the middle of the night, you might need to get something like um, a potty chair that you would have to take care of. It. And is that, a, is that a thing that the caregiver is going to have to empty in the morning? So there's lots of equipment. And we'll talk about that in, in a minute. So once you create a clear and really specific job description, then you know what you need somebody to do, which also will tell you how many hours a day, how many hours a week do I need somebody for? Like, oh, I thought I needed somebody two hours twice a week. Oh, then you can finish writing, writing your list. And you're like, oh, I need somebody at least four hours, three or four times a week. So once you write out your list, you'll have a better idea. Okay. Now. Be flexible and be fair about pay if you're hiring independently. I will tell you that the going rate for caregivers, private caregivers, is about $15 an hour. If you hire an agency, it's $30 to $45 an hour. So independent caregivers, but then that's you and the caregiver. Have, you're, the, you're the boss of the caregivers, so you have to worry about some other things we'll talk about in a minute. And if their kid is sick or they got sick and then there's nobody to show up, if you're with an agency, they can usually plug and play and get you somebody. 
So there's pros and cons to both ways of doing things. So if you're hiring independently rather than using an agency, you may want to be consider you may want to consider being flexible about the pay rate if you're asking them to do a lot of heavy duty things. And uh, most people won't come to somebody's house for less than four hours if, unless they live like two streets over. If they live close by, they might be willing to come in for two hours. And if it's kind of an easy gig, that might be it might be worth it for them to just come over for a couple hours. But mostly if they have to either take metro or they have to drive any kind of distance, it's not worth it for them. So it's really important to know to hire as locally as you can, because if you live in the woodlands, you're not hiring anybody who lives in Clear Lake. This is not going to happen. So um, when I would send out job leads in my subject line, I would say caregiver needed in 77401, my neighborhood. And so then I would say, if that's not you, then just delete it. Don't even don't even open it if, if you don't live here near near this near this uh, area. And one girl wrote me back, she said, you knew I lived up in the Northeast. I said, yeah, six months ago you lived there. I don't know where you live today. I said, again, delete it. Don't call me up and fuss at me. I said, if you don't want to get leads, I'll take you off my list. Just, no, no, no. I just was wondering why you're sending it. I said, sweetie, I send it out to everybody because I don't know what your situation is today. Maybe you moved in with your sister-in-law because, you know, things didn't work out with your landlord up in Tomball. So, so and, and, you know, I think it just hit her. She was having a bad day and she needed somebody to fuss at and she knew she could fuss at me. So there we go. Um, now, and in the job posting, you might want to state that the that the rate is flexible based on the person's experience, and again, how much stuff you need to be you know you need to, them to do for your loved one. Now, this often helps you get responses from candidates with more experience, and so the more experienced they are, they might want a little bit higher rate. Uh, Medicaid, we're going to get to that in a minute, but Medicaid pays about ten dollars an hour. It's very difficult to get somebody uh, who wants to work for Medicaid patient. Actually, somebody called me, they were paying $9.50 an hour. And I said, no, these guys can work at McDonald's and do better than that. And he said, yeah, he says, I know, but that's Medicaid. I said, well, I'm pretty sure I can't find you anybody. And I was not able to find anybody willing to take that. Again, unless they live two doors down and they're willing to do it. One girl took a job because it was in her apartment complex and she didn't even have to, and she used Metro. So she, she could just walk to this lady's um, job. So that worked out okay for her. Yes, sir. Okay. Pay the going rate in your area. Around here, it's about fourteen fifteen. Methodist is paying uh, PCAs, you know, the nurses' aides, they're paying seventeen eighty nine an hour. I just looked it up on our website since I work at Methodist now. So seventeen eighty nine for uh, patient care assistance, but for private caregivers, about fifteen is what you should expect to pay. Mm -hmm. If you offer them a lot less, you say, "Oh yeah, I can only pay ten bucks." you're probably not going to get anybody or not going to get anybody that's going to be really good. So it's, you have to be careful and you might, they might, they might not be likely to have the skills that you need them to have to take good care of your, of your family member. So I'm telling you that, you know, say, look, this was sort of generic, but um, if you looked at what people are, are asking again, agencies are 30 to 45. So private caregivers are 15. And I think that's pretty fair. Thank you, sir. Okay, pay legally. Okay, you don't want to get in trouble with the IRS because if you have somebody working for you and they're making twenty five hundred dollars a year, that is um, that that means that you are an employer employer and you are responsible for their W two and their taxes. So you have to withhold their taxes. I was cautioning my caregivers said, please, please don't just take money under the table and not pay your taxes. You won't get Medicare later in life. You won't get Social Security. You won't have worked enough quarters. You won't have put in enough money. And you're going to be in some trouble when you hit 65 or so and decide, oh, I need a break or I'm not feeling so great myself. So uh, you don't, uh, yeah, if you get audited by the IRS, it could be big trouble that could certainly outweigh any convenience or inconvenience that this might this might. Be. Now, you can create your own W-2s and tax forms. It's not real hard, but 
Um, you can even go to places like Baker Ripley, go to H&R Block, call your own accountant. You might have a friend who's an accountant say, how do I set this up? There are lots of online uh, forums that will help you with this, but I just strongly encourage you to please um, do it legally. It will save yourself a lot of hassle in the long run if you have if you if you ever get audited. So a service like Intuit or a caregiver focus like care.com or home pay, it's worth it's worth it's worth the trouble. Okay, who pays for it? The short answer is you do. Okay. Um, most caregivers are private pay and the going rate is 15 an hour. Now, some veterans plans have a time and attendance benefit. So you can apply for that. And I can encourage some of my caregivers, if they were interested in taking care of veterans, that they could sign up to be uh, to be VA providers. Th that's all they have to do. They just have to sign up and like register for that. And they just get, I guess they get referrals. Refer yeah, they, yeah. So they'll get referrals through there. But they're official. And you can't get paid by the VA unless you're already on their list. Same thing with Medicaid Star Plus that has provisions for caregivers and even pay some qualified family members to provide care. But again, you have to apply and sign up to be a provider. Um, some Medicare Advantage plans, uh, you'll see those commercials, you, if you watch daytime TV and you know days when I'm home, I've got the TV on. Uh, and there are some shows that like, Blue Bloods does nothing but talk about life insurance and, and Medicare Advantage plans. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know, they, I guess they know their audience. Uh, so they, they have provisions for caregivers, but straight Medicare does not. Your Medicare supplement plan does not, unless you maybe look at some of the long-term care provisions and make sure that it's a caregiver proviso on there as well, that they will take care of it. But here's the thing. If I'm a private caregiver making 15 an hour, I'm not accepted insurance. I, I'm just, I just can't, I'm not going to probably do that. So you'd have to find out if you can pay your caregiver and get reimbursed from your from your insurance company. So, and and every single one is gonna be different. So whoever you have, or if you're looking to sign up for one, you might say, hey, what's the scoop with caregivers and what's the scoop with long-term care? So uh, you can call the United Way at 211 and ask them about the resources in your zip code. I called them yesterday and I said, hi, Talk, you know, want to talk to you about getting a caregiver. And they had this whole list of questions that, okay, time out. I said, mm, I don't need it for me. I'm doing a talk and I wanted to be able to give some absolutely current information. And they said, it's going to be different for everybody depending on their situation and their zip code and what their insurance is. And I said, okay, fine. So I just changed that, said, just call 211. The, the people on the phone are delightful and they will be happy to talk you through and give you the information that they have and get you sorted out. So there are some agents, they, they have some, there are some nonprofits that have caregivers. CCSC, not only do did we train people, but we also do place people. So you, if you want to go on their website, ccschouston.org, there is a, who we are and this, how we help, drop down employment programs, drop down, hire a caregiver, caregiver request form, click on that, fill it out, it goes to the director and hopefully she will be able to um, find somebody to meet your needs. Be as specific, we were talking about that earlier, be as specific as you can be. Again, uh, they thought I was, they, they fussed at me uh, and I said, yeah, I wanna know if there's a, if, if you have dogs and cats and ferrets and parakeets, I wanna know what's in the house. A couple of the, the ladies I had weren't able, they, they went for an interview, lady had three dogs, Vanessa is allergic to dogs, she couldn't even go in for the interview. So I said, well, that's the thing, these are questions that they have learned to ask um, before they make an appointment for an in-person interview. What was the dot .com one you just mentioned? Oh, ccschouston.org. I didn't do a dot .com, I don't think. That's the Christian? Christian Community Service Center, Houston, it's right, you know, right down the road here ccschouston.org and when you go on to how we help and drop down and there'll be a, a place that says hire a caregiver they also have for housekeepers their martha's way program uh, they've been training housekeepers for 20 years and the caregiver program is newer it's i guess now about three years old but um 
So you can either hire a housekeeper or hire a caregiver or both. One of uh, my favorite girls, Laura, she is spent, uh, the housekeeping program is only taught in Spanish. Caregiver program was taught in English, Philadelphia English, by the way, just to be more specific. Thank you for getting that. Uh, and Laura is Spanish speaking. She's bilingual. So she took the Martha's way as well. So she can go and be a housekeeper and, and a caregiver. So that was, I was really smart on her part. Um, but, the, but United Way, if you call them, they can also direct you. But I also gave you those other resources for where to try and find a caregiver. Okay, so, okay. Have multiple interviews and a trial period. Interviewing a potential caregiver just wants this isn't going to give you enough information to make a good decision. Okay, if they show up drunk and stupid and, you know, slurring their speech, okay, that gives you enough information. Yeah, you know, that you can just, you can, you can probably say, I don't think I need you taking care of my, of my, my dear nan. But if it's just a basic interview, you might need them to come back more than once to make the best choice. So, a brief screening interview via the phone to make sure they meet your basic requirements, that they are available on the days and the hours that you need them, that the salary is going to work out for them, that they've got transportation to get to your place, that they're not afraid of your, you know, of your kitty cat and your bird or your whatever, uh, or that if you say, oh, yes, uh, I do, I, I do dog training, I do dog training in my house and I have 17 Rottweilers this week. That may, that may put somebody off. They might say, mm, you might not be the right house for me. But if they say, oh, I love big dogs. Okay, you're my kind of people. Then there you go. And then you want an in-person interview to meet the candidates who pass your phone screen. And then uh, another in-person interview where maybe the top one or two that you really like meet with the actual person that you're going to take care of. If you're the one doing the screening, if you're not hiring them for yourself, if you're hiring them for your mom or your whoever, then bring them into the mix and just make sure that it's it's a good fit and that they're going to click. Does that make sense? Anything I said doesn't make sense or any, any questions about anything we've said so far? We cool? Everybody have me all cool? Is there anybody in the chat? Any questions in the chat for us? Uh, I'll check that out. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Okay. Now, real life is different from just an interview. Everybody's on their best behavior and they sit up nice and straight and they smile and, you know, but real life is different. So you want to arrange a little bit of a trial period before signing a contract and making it permanent. So that means you're going to be home when Vanessa is coming in to take care of your mom. So you're going to be around. You're just going to be like observing and just, you know, oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm going to be doing laundry and folding the clothes. Mm, I'm making. So it gives you a chance to just check it out and see how do they talk to people? How do they, are they communicating well? Are they kind are they patient are they listening to the needs of your of your loved one if if grandma is a little bit slow to get her words out you don't need somebody who's like let's go let's go let's go let's go so you need somebody who's going to be right on on the same wavelength in my um curriculum there is a video that breaks my heart to show but uh nanny cams are a good idea get a nanny cam get several have them around the house and a woman here in Houston went to jail for abuse, caught on the nanny cam, 94-year-old client. Um, she gave the dog a piece of her food and the, and the caregiver hit her. Yeah, terrible. So, um, and this also gives the caregiver a chance to make sure that the job meets their expectations as well. Is, is it a good fit for them as well as for you? So nanny cams, I didn't put that in there, but put nanny cams, I'll fix it. Okay, so, okay, so set up a one week trial period, align on expectations and write them down. You know, what, what do you expect from them? But again, if we have a contract, a written contract, which I'm gonna send you, that will be easier. Remember the trials are paid. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not a freebie. You are gonna pay them for their time to be there. Uh, set yourself up for success. The trial should actually closely mirror what real what real life is like. So if it's going to be, they're going to give grandma a bath every time they're here. They're going to give her a bath. They're going to help her get dressed. They're going to um, feed her. They're going to make breakfast. Then they're going to feed her. Then they're going to clean it up, get her into the living room, set her up um, on the couch to watch TV. 
or play some games or take a walk or do whatever. So set up the trial to do what you really would want that person to do in real life. And be open about what you want and what you expect and encourage them to be open as well, because it doesn't work out if everybody's, you say, oh man, I wish you wouldn't have done that. Or I wish, I wish you'd do this other thing instead. She can't read your mind. Tell her or him. There are male caregivers, not a lot, but there are male caregivers as well. So make yourself available at home, especially for this trial period. If families can make it work, it's good to be home at least for part of the day while the trial run, while there's a trial run with a new caregiver, at least in the very beginning. So if you can come home from work at lunchtime, or if you can just make yourself, you know, you're just doing other things around the house, but you're available in case the caregiver has a question or your loved one, your family member has, a, has an issue or a question. And if it doesn't feel like it's a good fit, first of all, be honest, but also be kind and be direct and share why it's not working out and that you're sorry about that, but that it's just not a good fit and thank them, but, you know, wish them well on their, on their journey, but, you know, not everybody's a good fit for everybody. So, yes, sir. Okay. Ask plenty of questions. So it helps you find somebody who's compassionate, reliable, res responsible, and trustworthy. So ask them about their past experience or what would they do in specific situations? What are you going to do if, if, if Peggy says, no, I don't want to take a bath. Come on, Peggy. Come on, Miss Peggy. It's time. It's time to go to get your bath. No, no. Okay, fine. Okay. No. So what, ask them, what are they going to do in that situation? Or if, if, if I've made, if I've spent a lot of time, you know, making a really pretty lunch and I give lunch to Miss Peggy, and, and she turns her nose up and says, I don't want that. I'm like, Miss Peggy, I just spent 45 minutes making this lunch for you. I don't care. I don't like it. How are they going to handle that? So set up a scenario. And uh, okay, so sometimes it can be a thing. Okay, if you, if you want Philly girl to be happy and feed me lunch, you could bring me a cheesesteak. That's going to make me very happy. Bring, I'd be very happy with that. There are things that would make me very happy. I'm Italian. If you're going to make some pasta, it better better be good. It better be as good as my mother made. But you know that's hard to, hard to, hard to beat. So it may be a cultural thing. So maybe if you're making foods or your caregiver is making foods that Miss Peggy didn't grow up with, doesn't like, never liked, says, "Oh, I hate tuna fish. I never liked tuna fish as a kid. I had was forced to eat it. I can't stand it." So know what her likes and dislikes are. And, and and adjust adjust the plan to her likes and dislikes. It will probably help increase help increase the chances of success. So, but find out what we what would you do if Peggy says no? I don't want to take a bath right now. No, I don't want to eat breakfast right now. So get them you know play a little little role playing would be good. Now again, um, if the if your loved one has a little dementia and they have incontinence, but now they were refusing to get cleaned up. How is the caregiver going to handle that? Good ones are going to be able to redirect and get, you know, and just, just engage with the client and then maybe help them see that it will be more comfortable and just say, oh, come on with me. Come help me in the bathroom. Come on. I need to go. Come help. Come with me. Come help me. And then when they get in there, then you can help, help them with what they need to get done. So, uh, or if the, now here's the thing, put in about medication and we'll talk about that because Peggy and I role played that earlier. Caregivers are not nurses. They do not give medication. But, okay, um, Miss Peggy, here's your blood pressure pills. Here's a blood pressure bottle. Okay, so, you know, it's time, it's lunchtime. It's lunchtime now. It's time to take your blood pressure medicine. So Miss Peggy can open the bottle. She can put out her, take out her medicine. She can take, put the, I can remind her to take it. I can't hand it to her. I can't stick it in her mouth. I can't put it in applesauce. I can't give it to her. Now, God forbid, Miss Peggy has some really bad tremors. And if, if she tried to open the bottle, the pills would go all over the place. But she can say, here, Miss Peggy, um, um, here's, your, here's, your, here's your bottle of blood pressure medicine. What do you want me to do? You can take the top off. I can take the top off. Tell me what to do. You can set it down or you can she can tell put me on the table. She can tell me to give put one on their table and she can 
eventually pick it up. Or if she can't pick it up because her tremors are so bad, I can give it to her and see that it gets in her mouth. But she has told me what to do. She, yeah, I know that. I, I see your face. You made, made, you, made a little, you made a little face at me. I see that. But that's the way, that's the law. So noted. So noted. I encourage people to not go above beyond their scope of practice. I don't want anybody to get in trouble. Now, caregivers who work for an agency and are trained by a nursing supervisor, they can do some extra caregivers don't give medicines, but they can do some other treatments. Same thing in a private situation. If somebody trains them how to do trach care or Foley catheter care or some basic little wound care, if they're trained to do that and you feel comfortable that, or the nurse, and we'll talk about home health in a second too, um, the nurse checks them off and they say, okay, uh, caregiver Maureen knows how to do this task. Okay, good. Then I can do that. Uh, okay. Uh, now, next one, sir. Check the references. Oh, let me go back to home health. Let's, so home health. If somebody comes home from the hospital after a big surgery, after a big accident, God forbid, and the doctor orders home health, that is a medical order. It is paid for by insurance both private insurance and Medicare and Medicaid all pays for home health. Home health will send a nurse, uh, a nurse about once a week, and then the nurse will assign um, a caregiver or a nurse's aide two or three times a week to come in and do care. If you already have a caregiver on board, I strongly suggest you still keep them around and they can be extra care. Same thing for, for with hospice services. So but it's a, that would be a, a separate and extra person. And when we were at Memorial City, we saw lots of lots of patients come with their caregivers uh, who stayed at the, in, the, in the room with them and just attended to them. And we were able to um, help the nurses and let the nurses know that the, the, that the patient needed something. So check their references. Even if they sounded fantastic, seemed like it was a great fit, call the references, ask them how did things go, ask them if the clients were had similar issues. So if, if uh, I have some people that, I had some people that uh, told me that they really were specializing in taking care of clients with dementia, that they, they had family members with that and they really had a passion for that. Some other people really liked physical therapy kind of stuff. So they liked injuries and accidents and they, and more short, shorter term gigs where when you get done with your hip replacement treatment and your physical therapy, it's going to be adios, see you next time. But patients with dementia, it's, usually, it's progressive. And so those caregivers are going to be in the, for the long haul. So think about, so contact the references and see what they say about them. Ask how they performed on the job. Were they reliable? Would they hire that person again? And if they would recommend that candidate for the job that you want to hire them for? That's fair. I mean, everybody does that. Every job, every job that you get, they, they check your references. Um, since older adults are at risk for fraud and abuse, it's wise to check for a criminal record. You can get a background check done. It's not that hard. It doesn't cost that much. So it's a good idea. Now, uh, we checked background records on people that were taking the class. And if somebody had, oh, somebody come back from overseas, they'd been gone for a long time. And 14 years ago, they got arrested for, they, they were driving without a license. Okay, I'm not worried about that. There was no, there was no fraud. There was no theft. There was no drug use. There was no, no other bad things. So they just hadn't gotten their license renewed in time, and they ran a stop sign, or they, yeah, they they rolled through a stop sign, and they got they got into trouble for that. So I wasn't that worried about those things. But anybody who had a criminal, um, a felony record, were not allowed to take my class. But misdemeanors were on a case by case basis. And I did have one, one lady when I said, am I going to find any surprises? She said, ooh, I have a very colorful background. Six pages later, <laughs> I said, yeah, no kidding, Rosie, you sure do. So I had to get her, this, that's what I called you that. The one mm. you sent me to work, Faith. Uh, so I got that person connected to something else. So yeah, I felt badly that I couldn't help her, but it wasn't going to work out for that. So <laughs> Yeah, you want to make sure that that anybody you're hiring is not is not a con artist, and uh, and also be careful. One of the girls, you know her from Memorial City. I'll tell you later. Uh, she, her dad's in Mississippi. They hired caregivers, and the caregiver would show up with the caregiver's boyfriend and three or four kids in tow. I'll take care of. 
<laughs> yeah. A whole family affair. Yeah, a whole family affair. And they weren't helping though. And so this kid is buying all these this food and comes by and finds that there's no food left and the place is kind of a mess. So um <clears throat> and meanwhile, that person works. Uh my friend, she has a job helping people find caregivers. And so, but that's here in town and her dad was in, was in another state, but yeah, she went in for a surprise visit because she, she was, she thought something was up and dad was being, I think dad had a little bit of a dementia more, maybe more than was recognized at first and um, oops, so busted. So yeah. And dad was refusing to come, to come West. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, so employment contract. I'm going to send you at least one, if not several. Now, the one of, okay, I know 12 pages sounds insane, but when you look at how, there's one place where it's got 24 hours, like 12, one, eight, all the way down. And so what are you, what do you want in these caregivers? So when you look at, what do I want on, a, if I'm looking at a clock, what do I want this person to do at different times of the day? And yeah, um, I did place somebody as a live-in caregiver, uh, kind of in the country. That was kind of fun. And uh, she had her own little, little in-law suite and uh, used to the car. And they had chickens and cows and a couple of ducks and a goat. It was very, we'll see, for a city girl, I mean, that sounds, that sounds fun, but maybe a screaming chickens at 5 a.m. might not be so much fun for me. But um, so you're both going to, you're both going to sign the contract. So you would need to make a copy. So you would scan it in your computer or have them take a picture of it. So you sign it, they sign it. And I would say that you want to review it every, you know, maybe at least every six months. So update it, review it. If things change, if, if grandma gets worse or if grandma gets better, you know, maybe she's had uh, medical issues and maybe she's going to improve, or maybe she's got degenerative situation that's not going to improve. And so if the care is heavier, you might need to increase the hours or maybe even increase the pay. So think about that. So what you want to provide is a detailed job description, the hours that you need somebody, the pay schedule, pay periods, and anything else that you agree upon on the interview process. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. Um, oh, they took notes and now he's gonna quiz me. Oh, geez, Peg, you didn't tell me that. At the very beginning, you said this is not a about family caregivers. What's, what's the difference? Okay. Well, when my mother stayed with me, I'm a family member. I was not a paid caregiver who, you know, came and went. She came and lived at my house and I took care of her. Uh, oh, I'm glad you asked that. I'm really glad you asked that because there are some, there is some training available in town for people who need to learn how to take care of a family member. Now, you might also have to hire people, but if you want to learn, you can look at the AARP website and depends on what's going on with your loved one. If they have Alzheimer's, you can look at alz.org. The Alzheimer's Association has some caregiver training. Does an amazing place do some family care? Yeah. Amazing, amazing place, place. Has, having caregiver and actually the Hope and Healing Center. I'm in the process of developing a caregiver program for the Hope and Healing Center. So, unfortunately, uh, the Chinese Community Center has one, but it's in Chinese, so that's a problem. Um, I went out there to talk to them, and they said, Oh, yeah, no, their place is really nice. Their community center is very nice. It's an eight hour class, it's two Saturdays for four mornings, but it's in Chinese. So, oops, so that doesn't help us. But uh, the AARP. The Alzheimer's Association and then also Amazing Place have some shorter. The one that I taught at, at Christian Community Service Center was geared to people who want to go out and do this as a job. So there were several units, several modules where I talked to them about how to set up a business, how to advertise themselves, how to find clients, which is not the stuff you guys need to know. Um, and But you need to know about how do I bathe somebody? How do I feed them? How do I help to transport them? I mean, and by transport, I mean how do we, how do you get somebody up out of bed uh, and get them from the bedroom to the bathroom to the kitchen to the living room and back again? And how do I do that on a schedule that makes sense and and also is safe for them and safe for you? Because if you don't do it safely for yourself, you're going to hurt your back. And neck and spine and hip and knees and then you're going to be on the ground too and that won't be good for anybody 
I'm really glad you asked me that. Who needs the contract when you decide that the person is serving has already signed the contract? Uh, what obligation do you have to carry through? I am not an attorney. You would really have to, but it's, uh, so I, I don't really have an answer for that because I'm not a lawyer. And I'm going to say the contract really is, it's a, because it's not being notarized by anybody. It's not, it's not really a legal binding document, but it is something to show that you're both serious about, about this, this job, about this situation. So. Okay, one more question sure. is, uh, if you would ask the caretaker to transport the patient say, to the doctor's office, mm -hmm. what liability do you have? Okay. Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. Um, if, okay, now that depends. So this is one of the things I talk about with the caregivers and say, if ask about, am I going to be responsible for taking Miss Peggy to the doctor? And am I going to take, am I going to take Miss Peggy in her car or in my car? If I'm taking her in her car, then, then she has to call her insurance company and get me as an, an approved driver and get me insured. If I'm taking her in my car, I've got to call my insurance guy and say, I am transporting clients not any different, I guess, from an Uber or Lyft kind of guy. I'm transporting clients. I need to increase my insurance. So that's the thing. And that will depend on what kind, who's, whose car are they going in? Uh, I do, I did have somebody who had a driver's license, but didn't have a car. And so she, she was transporting people in their car and they were, they just made sure that she was on their insurance. And is there more of an expense that you are, I don't know what your insurance, you know, you're gonna to have to talk to your insurance agent and say, what's, what would be the difference? What, what would change if I have to, if I have to add Maureen, my caregiver to our insurance policy as an approved driver? As yeah. My and even if you're using an agency, you have to make it clear to them that the person will be asked to do um, driving mm -hmm. duties, mm -hmm. they actually charge yeah. more for that because their yeah. insurance has their insur to be high. Right, you're right. Yeah. Well, I have to say, listening to all this, it's just eye-opening. At the same time, I wonder, what do people do when you're by yourself and you're really sick and you have to take care of all this? I would be getting even sicker. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, all the all this stuff to do. Well, that's I, why planning ahead is a, is a good thing to think about. Yeah, when, I wasn't planning on getting sick, and I was very grateful mm -hmm. that Dr. Roy lent me his daughter for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And it, his wife had been my primary care doctor, and mm -hmm. so and Camille, I God bless her, I I sing her praises all the time. She didn't have to do anything hard for me, but it was really a benefit. And I was very grateful that she was there to, to help me. So she had very light duty, but, um, and again, you have to figure out what exactly do you need? How much do you now? And there sometimes, uh, you might say, I need somebody Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You've decided I need Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 10 AM to 2 PM. Okay, fine. Well, you meet me, you love me. I'm your favorite caregiver of all time, but I'm not available Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm available Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Can you be flexible? Because I already have a client on those other days. And so if you can't be flexible, then I'll be like, thanks, but no thanks. I've already got this other person. And sometimes uh, one of the girls has, like there were three of them, they've gotten they've gotten so busy that they form their own little co-op and they sort of share clients, but th th they and the client independently sign their own contracts, but they refer to each other and I would be happy with any of the three of them. I mean, I would, if I got sick, they would be the, the are you available? No, okay. All the three of you, you could all come. I'll pay all of you to come and take care of me. So, yeah. And to answer your question, my dad had to wrestle with that mm -hmm. because he made a choice to stay in Tennessee when right. my brother lived in Maine, my other brother lived in the state of Washington and I lived in Texas. I remember that. And when we got to the point where we had to have 24-7 somebody there because he couldn't be in the house alone. It was a fall risk. He was on oxygen. He had all kinds of things going on. And he had long-term care insurance, which paid for about half 
of what it costs to have a person. And in Jackson, Tennessee, it's a lot cheaper than it is in Houston, Texas. But he was still going to have to pay about seven or eight thousand dollars a month out of pocket. Mm. And he said, oh. and he looked at he found an assisted living facility that mm. suited him, and he made the decision to move. Yeah, all actually, uh, I had to talk to two different people. The one that I just happened to meet here at the Karen Church, she's not a member, but uh, her husband had passed away last year, and so I was just asking her, I said, what do you do now? Well, I'm actually, she said, I started a, a high-end caregiving thing, and I believe she had worked uh, in the medical center. She has a... Mm -hmm. Uh, or anything but a, a master's and so I guess she ended her job there and then so she's doing this now it's a high end whatever there's a so there's a woman here named Dr. Ruth Justice who had been a oh, yeah, PhD yeah, yeah. and uh, she started her own and it's very that's, high end that's it's right, very expensive right, yeah. but her people are very well trained they're very well compensated um so yeah so, so so she and i yeah i had talked to her about a couple of years ago when she told me that what she's doing but anyway uh so they are then there to do all these things that you i mean that you just mm -hmm. you know brought up you know but this is a lot to deal with it. this is a lot to deal with it. Mm -hmm. and and they have of course certain people already placed they know already, they have checked them out. They did the background check. I don't even know where to go get a background check for somebody. I don't do that. I guess I, I think it's guess I could find stuff hard to do. It's like this, the kind of thing you'd want to figure out to do before you need the assistance. Yeah, yeah. Right. There are companies who'll do that for you, but it's not that hard to do it for yourself. You can get a driver's license check and a criminal background check mm -hmm. there's some websites that mm -hmm. the state runs mm -hmm. where you can do that and then that whole issue with you know the tags the w2 form i i have a friend who was hiring caregivers for her mother for round the clock mm -hmm. and that was basically Taking care of that became a full time job for yeah. her. Mm -hmm. Just organizing that, she had really good people. I can, I can um, but it was it was an adventure. Mm -hmm. So well, that's kind of, you're kind of hitting on exactly what our interest is: is that we're planning ahead, and all of our kids move outside of Texas, and so they're not going to be real interested in moving back here and taking care of us. So. Um, is there, and you know, if we get to a point where we're not able to coordinate all this ourselves, and is there a, you mentioned Dr. Ruth Justice, but is, is there, is there somebody that's higher level that we could, not you can, there, could hire to come and kind of manage this? There are professional case managers. Mm -hmm. Um, I also happen to be president of the Houston Gerontological Society, and a lot of our members our case yes. managers. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and um, they're usually folks who have been social workers or nurses that have gone into this and hung up their own shingle. Mm -hmm. They are not cheap. Mm -hmm. well, what's not cheap? Uh, some of them go upwards of $250 an hour. It's almost mm -hmm. like hiring a lawyer. Um, we can help you to get started. No, they're not. But um, um, some of the folks are really, really good, and some of them are mediocre. I mean, I'll be honest. So you have to do everything that Maureen talked about in terms of hiring a caregiver. You can almost duplicate those steps for hiring a case manager or care manager. And it's called time, you wouldn't need a case manager full time I no think. you what you do is you ask them to do specific tasks right and so uh so if you want a case manager to kind of run the, the care management so a person can stay at their home when they can't do to take care of themselves what how much how much uh how many hours a week or something would you say is kind of a good answer to that? Yeah, 
it's it's I don't even want to hazard a guess because it's different for everybody. If your care is relatively simple and you have a re regular cadre of folks who are coming, I actually we have somebody in our cares resources um, who it's called Margaret Care, and mm -hmm. she does care management as well as providing people. So she does both, and she's a nurse practitioner herself. Mm -hmm. So that, but that's practical to find somebody to do one of the things. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. I hope you found this helpful. We want to thank everybody who came in today and uh, everybody who joined us on Zoom today. We very much appreciate your time. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to send out the resources that we have in addition to additional slides later on. So for those of you on Zoom, have a great rest of the week and a good weekend. Um, I have a few sitting upstairs. Um, that's a group of resources.